listening to Out of the Box Podcast with Rosie Tran. Please subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher Radio and leave a positive comment if you like us. Out of the Box Podcast is sponsored by HugMeTees.com. Hug Me Tees. Spread love, give a hug. HugMeTees.com. I'm here today with Connor Habib, sex expert, writer for Salon.com, Vice.com. And also he has a book coming out, Remaking Sex, on just info. How are you doing today? I'm great. Yes, I am great. <laughs> <laughs> I was just working on that book yesterday till 2.30 in the morning. I, I saw your tweet. Down. I was so worried. I'm like, is he going to be able to make it? Is he going to be sleeping all day on his, <laughs> on his bed going, no, I can't make it? <laughs> no, I, I never, I don't recommend working till that early to anybody at all. It's a terrible thing that I did. <laughs> but I had a deadline, so. <laughs> I'm really excited about having you because you're kind of a jack of all trades. And I think like you kind of represent the new man in society because you know back in the day we had just this one career and we're very pigeonholed into one place and you have a bunch of things going on and it seems like you're very successful at them thanks yeah i mean i think when i was younger i definitely always idolized that sort of renaissance figure right that like the person who knew about biology and knew about you know anatomy but also knew about architecture and knew about literature and all that kind of stuff. That to me was always really exciting. And so I've tried to live my life that way because I feel like a lot of the most interesting stuff comes out of people when they look at a lot of things at once instead of just focusing as an expert narrowly on one. Now, I mean, experts are are valuable, of course, but it just was never interesting to me. It was like, how can we have something new and it would be by building bridges between different disciplines and you know unexpected places i think that that's so true and also it's kind of a holistic approach on things because sometimes people focus on just one area and they get so kind of narrow-sighted about it they don't realize that every single part of humanity in our world is connected and you know like albert einstein would do that when he would get so obsessed with science he would go in nature or take a walk or go be physically fit and that would bring about you know something completely unrelated quote unquote to science would bring him a scientific thought or idea or clear his mind so i think that's great that you know you're i know you're doing you're a biology expert anarchist expert (laughs) sexologist like what everything what like what are what is your business card look like is it just slash 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 it's just a question mark (laughs) Um, (laughs) yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. I don't have a business card. Um, but I think it would just have to say my name. I mean, I feel like that's the other thing too. It's like, it allows you to be an individual. I mean, when, when you, it, it creates some loneliness though. I mean, it's something I wrote a long time ago, which is like, if you ever want to feel lonely, pursue everything you love all at once. And that just means like, when you start looking at everything you care about instead of just sort of like throwing certain things out and, you know, really, I I think, uh, you can have a sense of, am I the only one doing this? Am I the only one interested in, um, symbiosis in biology and (laughs) pornography, you know, so it can be like, you know, as it turns out, I am, no, that's, that's not true, but, but it can leave you feeling a little lonely, you know? Um, but that's okay. Um, it also, one of the reasons why it makes you feel lonely is because it starts to make you feel more, uh, present in your individuality. And so, I think my business card would just have my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think all of us have that air, that facet about us that we are we're multi you know we're multifaceted. We're not just one thing. You know, just because you're a lawyer doesn't mean that all you do in your entire life is law. You know, there is lawyers out there that have interest in you know art, music, science, other things. But I feel like our current society, at least, kind of likes to define people in molds. And what I like about the new age you know the millennials and the new generation is that because of the internet and people being able to have alternative sources of income and also share hobbies and other things you know via the world wide web people are beginning to discover that they're not just their label because you know you went to a party 20 30 years ago and you said well what do you do you know that was who you are right what do you do oh i'm a lawyer oh i'm a doctor not who are you and so i think that's really important for people to discover different aspects and you've kind of done that and been very successful you've won awards in all areas <laughs> <laughs> thank you i mean i think i think that is definitely also something that's happening now uh i mean not to not to uh dismiss people's pain because of the economic collapse but i think that's something that the economic collapse in 2008 brought to people too like 
oh, this job isn't going to be the job that I do for the rest of my life. I have to change. I have to become something else. It was like this weird thing where people have to just keep changing their shape. Like, well, that's not going to work, so I have to do this. Oh, uh, I got laid off, so now what am I going to do? I think a lot – I was hearing from a lot of people when they're getting laid off, like, you know, I'm just so happy to have been laid off because they just had this sense that they were going to be pulled on this track from where they were to death in this certain job. So – you know, people had to become inventive and creative about how they were going to make money. And so I think that was sort of a gift to people too. It made people say, okay, I was doing that. Was I actually interested in that? Or am I interested in something else? How can I do what I'm interested in? You know, and I think, uh, I think that's really, that's sort of a brighter side of something that was really difficult for a lot of people. I think it's a brighter side in general. And I know it's so cliche to say, oh, well, what's the positive that comes out of this negative? But, you know, it goes back to kind of the ancient philosophy of yin and yang, that there's always an opposite reaction to every action. And it's so true. It's like when something negative happens, if you sit there and wallow in the negativity, oh, you know, this recession, it's a horrible economy. But you have to say, hey, what what positive can come out of this? And I know for me, myself personally, you know, I was booking so many gigs, I was on the track to becoming a successful comedian and a lot of the gigs that I went to got boycotted I mean uh, as a comedian you know there's a comedy club circuit and there's the college circuit and then there's kind of this side market of bars and dent clubs and other things and a lot of them cut their budget they're like hey we're not making money so we usually have comedy on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and karaoke on Thursdays let's just cut it and do you know whatever let's have a DJ or let's how can we cut costs you know, if I pay a comedian, there's three comedians on the show, I got to pay X, Y, and Z. Why don't I just hire, you know, someone to come in and do dart night? So a lot of things got cut. And I said, well, I need to create other alternative incomes. And that made me more creative. And I think that that's something that came out of the recession was a lot of people, like you said, were like, hey, I need to like figure out what's going on. Right. Totally. And so I think it's a positive. But let's talk about your book because I'm so excited about it remaking sex and it just sounds so interesting so for those of you who don't know connor is also a, an adult film actor correct I, i'm fine with porn star i i like i like being a constellation that's nice and um a sex expert advocate educational person <laughs> sex star is also fun <laughs> yeah so um, it's going to be coming out this fall on, on the Disinfo label. And what um, what can we expect? Yeah, and and the, the deadline might actually have just been pushed back yesterday, but we'll but it'll be out. What either, you were writing like crazy all night long last I night? I know Come on. it'll either be out in the fall or it'll be out like in January. So it'll be like one or one or the other, but basically the same time frame. Um, so remaking sex. Uh, is a book that is sort of a tour through sex and how everything we know about sex is wrong. And um, true to the interdisciplinary way we're talking, it goes through the science of sex, the politics of sex, the economics, the cultural stuff. Um, I write about sex work and porn. I also write about um, uh, sex in the you know 18th and 17th century, and I write about the bacterial origins of sex. I write about everything, so it's just sort of going through every pocket of sex and trying to. It's called remaking sex because I'm trying to sort of redefine how we look at sex and how we can sort of do things better, so we don't keep um, uh, making sc- the same mistakes over and over and over again. Exactly, and teaching screwing our kids. ourselves, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and teaching our kids the wrong information over and over and over again. Right. I think that is a huge thing. I know that when I was growing up, I had girls left and right, and you know, I I'm not that old. I grew up with the internet. You know, making up stories about things, saying, hearing wives' tales, hearing misinformation, and I know that's just something that you do as a kid, but some of that misinformation can lead to bad stuff like pregnancies and STDs and other things. (laughs) Right. And I think, I think it's, it's all that stuff. And then, which is super important. And then all that stuff is connected to all kinds of other weird stuff that we, we don't really ask questions about like, why So what does that mean? Weird stuff. Like, why do we cover up our private parts? Like, why do we consider them private? Why, why are we we ashamed of them? Why are, or certain people? Yeah. Like, why can't we, why can't I just like, if I can eat a sandwich at the office, why can't I just jerk off at the office? Like, why is that a problem for people? Why do people see that as a violation? Now we can give answers to that. Like, well, because it would, you know, it's a, it's violating someone's consent and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But where does that come from? Where does that idea come from that this, 
aspect, this essential aspect of being a human is somehow cut off from everything else and off limits in a way that like sleep isn't or eating isn't or these other aspects that we know we need to be human. So I try to, as it turns out, a lot of those questions have historical answers. Um, and it's, it's very, it's very bizarre that they would have historical answers because we just assume that that's just the way it's always been. But in fact, when it comes to sex, there's almost nothing that's obvious. There's almost nothing that hasn't changed over time or, uh, between cultures. So, um, so I'm looking at those really basic assumptions and trying to pinpoint where we got them from. Should we keep them? Can we overturn them? What do we prefer? So what I'm hearing is that it sounds like you're deconstructing the belief systems behind sex and saying, what is the reason for this? Yeah, exactly. Just looking at um, the inherited metaphors and stories that we have about sex that we don't even know our stories. That We, we just, just think, oh, this is wrong or, oh, hello, this is how it is. Yeah, it's just yeah. water that the fish is in. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So what is the craziest statistic or one of the most absurd? You don't have to reveal the entire secret of the book. One of the facts that maybe you found that you were like, wow, this is really crazy. Okay. So um, one of the most A little teaser so that people get excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is actually... So one of the most challenging parts of the book to write was writing about sex offenders, right? So it's very touchy. It's very emotional. It's emotional for me, for a lot of people I know. It's a sort of very dark aspect of sex. So I did a lot of research looking into what exactly is going on with sex offenders because in our culture a sex offense is one of the worst things you can do now now did the nsa flag your computer as soon as you started googling this yeah, <laughs> for yeah, like right. days? i'm sure they had flagged they had flagged me long before so the, like why does he keep looking this up what's going on yeah, why? Right, yeah right exactly <laughs> obama's yeah. outside your house in the bushes <laughs> <laughs> that would see which i would consider an offense so yeah maybe a sex offense if he's looking into my windows um i you know and so one of the things that i found is um just the ways that we punish and react to sex offenses have almost no relation to what we would actually need to do to either rehabilitate people who have committed sex offenses or to help or support victims so um here's like a really easy example um in most states I think it's most, um, if not, if it's not most, it's a lot of them. When you get convicted of a sex offense, you get, uh, you can be put on this registry, right? Now, this is, this is, this is, every, Megan, this Megan is every state. Yes. Yeah, so you okay. have this sex offender registry where you have to put your name on, uh, in every state, um, there's a possibility of you being on that registry for life. Now, the weird thing is this sex offense, sex offender registry applies to people who have been violent sex criminals, like someone who's a serial rapist, for example, as well as someone who is 18 years old and has sex with uh, his or her 16 year old partner and is convicted like of statutory, statutory yeah. rape. Um, that person can be registered as sex offender for life, which means that their picture will be up in, you know. And it doesn't the, say the offense. It just They're just registered. Well, it, when you look at the sex offender registry and look at people's pictures, are you going to look at the offense if their picture is hanging up in the back of the... <laughs> In the, in the back of the grocery store, you know, or that person has to, you know, tell all your neighbors, hey, I was convicted of a sex offense. Um, but but even <clears throat> more than that. So you also have residency restrictions, which is like, OK, this person can't live within a thousand feet of where children congregate um, if they're convicted of a sex offense. Now. Almost every sex offender, almost every, there's a very small percentage, um, commits a sex offense against someone that he or she knows. So the idea of isolating them away from culture and keeping them a thousand feet from where children gather, which is almost everywhere in a city, um, is a completely backwards way to rehabilitate or work with somebody by putting them in an area because it has nothing to do with how likely they are to commit a crime. And I'll go even just a little further, <laughs> which is that we think that sex offenders have are just these incurable monsters that will just offend again and again and again. In fact, sex offenders have the lowest um, recidivism, which means repeat offense rate of any serious crime. So, and many sex offenders are, in fact, vic victims themselves exactly. of sexual abuse and other things. 
And if they weren't before they committed the offense, they certainly were when they were in prison for the offense. <laughs> So there's Mitzi, my co-host. <laughs> She's actually on the website now, guys. Go on out of the box podcast.com and you can see what the beautiful Mitzi looks like. Her picture is up as the co-host, the official out of the box <laughs> <She's> co-host. <a> <laughs> um, but so I bring all that stuff up to say, um, look, like here's this. I, I brought that example up to just be like, look, here's this thing we're super emotional about. And of course, there are emotional aspects. We need to take care of survivors. We need to work to eliminate these offenses, all that kind of stuff. But is the way we're doing it, does it have anything to do, um, and our emotional responses have anything to do with what would really help the situation or really see the situation clearly? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. And that's characteristic of so many things when it comes to sex. So, yeah. I agree with that. I just heard a story in NPR where actually a judge was coming forward and saying that the entire system needs to be reformed. Uh, she had a young woman who was forced to testify against her uh, rape, uh, you know, accused rapist, and she had been drugged, and they sh- they videotaped it, and she was forced to watch the video again in court and was traumatized by it, and um, the whole the rapists were gang members, and they were there with all in court with all other gang members that were not arrested that were there mm. supporting her. So she was surrounded by, you know, her rapist and also gang members and being forced to watch this on the victim side. And the judge was saying, Hey, how is this helping right. the victim at all? It's just, we're re traumatizing her over and over and over again, just to prosecute that. That doesn't make any sense. Right. And then you have the side where law enforcement, um, like I just wrote a part about how, uh, Police officers routinely and in police informants will routinely have sex with prostitutes so they can convict them of prostitution. Oh, my so gosh. That, that's horrible. <laughs> I'm going to be judgmental in this one. I know I preach non-judgment, but that's just not cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they'll have sex and they'll be like, okay, now you're going to jail. Like as soon as they the money changes hands. Um or and and that's actually part of police procedure even though in some places it's condemned a lot of times it's actually defended by state police departments so there's all kinds of weird stuff like that that's just cultural stuff i mean there's all sorts of other no, um, aspects in the book so it's not just all about sex offenders or sex you're crimes just or giving anything an like example that. exactly yeah. Yeah. But no i i've heard a lot of that and also girls that are that are young prostitutes being prosecuted for prostitution yet a lot of them are sex slaves being sold into sexual slavery and other things like that right. by pimps and through kidnappings and other things like that. So definitely our, our, our system around sex is not working <laughs> the right. way it should be. <laughs> and a lot of that just has to do with like our policies come from a place of cultural confusion and misunderstanding. So and when, taboo and taboo, Major exactly. taboo. Yeah. yeah. Without any real understanding. And, and again, all those, uh, all those things about sex, all those taboos, they usually have some place that you can point to in history where you're like, oh, that's where things started to go wrong. So I want to ask you, and maybe you might not know the answer to this, but maybe you, you do. It, it seems like, you know, I've read a lot about the ancient Romans being very sexually free and about certain cultures being sexually free. And then what I feel is it's, hey, it's 2014 and our society seems to be kind of sexually bipolar where we have these overtly sexual images on tv or in the media or whatever you know um and young girls or whatever being sexualized yet we we're still very conservative it's like kind of a bipolar thing Mm -hmm. but that hasn't always been the case in society so what where does this pendulum come from and what Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, part of it is that sex is always of use to whoever is in power, right? So because sex is sort of a self-generating thing, like we're always going to be thinking about it all the time, (laughs) like we're always going to be having sexual thoughts. Um, I call that in the book an ideological parasite. If someone is in power or is an institution or a person in power and they figure out a way to latch themselves onto sex – then they're going to get a continuously generated uh, source of attention, right? So, mm-hmm. like, um, so you know, one example I make in the book, without going into all the history of this, is you know, if you can make people feel guilty about masturbation, whether you're a neuroscientist in present day who says that porn addiction is a thing, and if you're masturbating, you're making yourself addicted to porn and changing your neural pathways, or if you're the church in the 18th century. Um, and, 
you sort of latch yourself onto that, then every time someone goes to stick their hand down their pants, they're going to think of your institution. So it's a way to gain <laughs> It's, it's kind of like branding and marketing. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's a weird... Exactly. It's, it's, it's a very old, primitive form of branding. It's true. That's a great Market way to say Market research it. companies, take note. Yes. And if you use that in your book, just quote me on the bottom. <laughs> so, totally. So I think, I think it's like, why is it bipolar now? It's like... We have um, people in power who are trying to use sex to get what they want. So that means they have to constantly put sex in the public eye for one reason or another, right? But then they can't just let people like sex itself. So this is why I say when people are like, oh, well, sex sells. I'm like, no, no, sex doesn't sell. Arousal sells. So, I mean, if you had a billboard that was a dick and a pussy and they were like, you know, one, the dick was going into the pussy or the pussy was enveloping the penis and it said buy Budweiser, that would be sex sells. But what we have right now is someone in a, a woman in a bikini or, you know, if it's like whatever. They're so- selling an ideology. They're selling, yes. With a, a feeling or a... Yes, yeah. and the feeling is, we're going to get you aroused. And then the way to get off, the way to consummate this arousal is to buy our product. So for me, that is true. I don't like to use pornography pejoratively. But if anything is pornographic in a bad way or dehumanizing or objectification in a bad way, that would be it. Because at least porn, at least whatever, is actual human interaction where people are consummating the relationship but these images are like oh we're gonna get you close we're gonna get you close now buy our computer <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like the carrot on the stick yeah exactly exactly yeah <laughs> it's the dildo and the f- flesh jack or something but yeah i mean I, <laughs> but, on the stick yeah exactly <laughs> on the yeah. fishing line <laughs> yeah right so i mean i think i think that's part of it it's like Sex is useful to people that are in power, so they can't totally cover it up. Um, but it's also, and it's also something that people want to engage in, obviously, and they're excited about. But um, because it's only useful if it's used somehow by those people, that's why we also feel like crap about it. I think that the taboo around it is something that has always confused me, especially when you're a little kid and you kind of start learning, you know, what is what and and then because you're so innocent and you're not doing anything to be evil or corrupt, you know, when you're a little kid and then it just to see the reactions, you know, if you have a little kid say any type of sexual derivative Mm -hmm. to a parent, just to see their face just completely turn bright red, you know, the reactions I've seen range from punishing the child, yelling, the child yelling at the child, where did you hear that? And most children that are asking about it are generally are genuinely like, what is this? Like, I'm just curious. I don't know what this is. And your reaction is like teaching them, hey, that's not a good thing. But it's nothing. It's kind of like what you said in the beginning. Why can why is hunger a primordial desire that can be satisfied in a public place? I can eat a sandwich if I'm starving. I can eat a sandwich. You know, why is thirst or other things? Sexuality is a is a you know an urge it's a natural urge yet it, we're told no right you know we can't express it or there's something wrong with it or it, it's something that's to be behind closed doors or private and to me it's really bizarre and i'm not saying we need to throw out culture and just you know suddenly people can have sex at the mall or whatever i'm not saying that i'm just saying we need to ask why why is that so and keep asking like a kid why why that? Why that? Why that? Keep asking the why question so we can sort of just loosen up our attitudes about it a little bit. So, I mean, my, you know, my book has all these like at the end has all these sort of solutions like, well, this could make things better. This could make things better. But I caution. I'm like, don't think you have to adopt all of these or even completely adopt one of them. Just try to do them a little bit more in your life and it'll loosen things up for you. So you're not so attached to being afraid, being ashamed. Uh, condemning other people, being afraid of other people's desires, judging, you know, creating policies that demonize people, all that kind of stuff. So, And also, I think, make sure that the why has an answer. If you come up to a wall and the why is, well, that's just how it is, you got to keep going. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Whenever the, whenever the answer to the why is because that's how it is, yeah. come on, people. <laughs> and ask why again. You know, continue to ask why. Yeah, that's just the way it is. Well, why? No, I, I totally agree with you. And... 
or, or at least notice if you're not ready to ask why beyond that, right? At least notice, just be like, oh, I'm just not willing to go there. And just admit that to yourself. Like we can't, I'm not going to admit every, I mean, like I have a little section in my book about bestiality, right? And, um, uh oh, Mincy, cover your yeah. ears. <laughs> cover your ears. She's giving you a baleful she look. She is giving a She's, look. Yeah, or maybe that's actually <laughs> exciting. She's licking her chops right now, actually. Um, but but I, I do get into this like thing of like, well, um, you know, we need to think about how we demonize people who have sex with animals. Now, there are all sorts of consent issues, and I understand all of that. And we can, we can, I'm not going to get into that right now when I'm talking to you about it. All I'm saying is, we might get to a point with that where we're like, ugh, I'm just not, I'm not willing to think about that. <laughs> I don't want to ask any more so, whys. <laughs> to, totally. I don't want to ask any more whys. But when you get to that point, just be like, I have to admit that I'm not willing to ask more. So that's okay. But, it, but we but don't there even is do that. Another, there is another answer. I just don't know what it is and I don't want to go there. And don't create your whole moral structure around... Um, around well that's just the way it is just be like or that's just wrong i hear that a lot that's just wrong well, exactly. why is it wrong <laughs> exactly just uh, yeah exactly so the alternative is instead well that's just wrong and to say well i just think that's wrong i'm not sure why maybe i'll think about it some other time you know yeah that's no. a looser attitude you know and i think that that's very important and again i'm not saying that we should go fuck animals <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> we need to think about and, and in fact i say something and i write something in the book about how maybe you know we shouldn't consider this ethically correct but i'm just saying we need to think about what our reasons are and that's different yeah. but just in general too you know i have talked about um I, I, I can't remember if it was on an online forum or where, but I, I was saying, you know, because some arguments against gay marriage are, well, if we let gay people let, get married, then what about multiple marriages? And I have always said, well, who cares if someone wants to marry three people? I mean, honestly, right. I don't care. I agree. And I feel like it just if you care about what other people are doing in their private life, you know, who cares? And I had someone retaliate online very angrily and say, well, what would be the logistics of that? You know, you can't you can't just let this and that and and they, and they weren't willing and i was saying and i what i wanted to say was well what about the logistics of that you know if someone gets married and they get a divorce they just divide it evenly and right. to me i didn't f- feel like there was all this attachment to it and i felt like the the listener or the reader was very attached to a very a certain type of answer because of their um constrictual upbringing or their belief system or whatever right. but it's like there's always a solution. There's always an answer and it doesn't have to be a certain way, you know? Right. And I think, I think what you're saying in, in a different way, um, is, you know, we, our duty is to our, is to expand our imagination. And so it's like when you, when you hit a problem that you feel like you don't have an answer to, it means that you've exhausted your imagination. So let's work more. And I think that's true of lots of social problems. I mean, I think it's true of war. Like when people say, well, war is just an aspect of human. It's like, okay, that historically you're right. Um, but I'm going to try to imagine a world where there's another option. Exactly. And that is the only thing that would make that other option possible. <laughs> so as soon as you say, I'm not even going to imagine it, you've made it impossible. Exactly. Yeah. And there are so many other options than war. And there are so many other options in saying this person doesn't have this right. And this person does have this right. Right. And to me, I I don't want to go into this completely, but I I feel like certain social issues are used to emotionally anger people and take them away from the real issues. For example, gay marriage. Of course, gay people should be able to be married. They're people and they should have the same rights as other people. It doesn't make any logical sense, but I feel like gay marriage is used to rile people up, to take, to take attention away from the fact that there's massive inequality, to take away from the fact that I, I think a lot of social issues are used to do that. They're kind of used to pull people's heartstrings and their belief systems to kind of control different voting techniques. Yeah. And sometimes I think that the, the sort of, uh, the issue is a, is a symptom of anxieties that people are feeling. So like uh, a week ago, there was a thing on Twitter where uh, people were really upset about private versus public Twitter, meaning a lot of people felt like their Twitter was private. Now, I, uh, whatever you view about this, you know, they thought, they thought like, okay, well, if someone who's like a big person 
you know, if I, if I have like 15 followers and someone who has 20,000 followers starts retweeting my stuff with, without asking me, I feel sort of like there's an invasion of my privacy. Now, I know a lot of people who are listening to this are thinking, oh my gosh, that's so dumb, um, <laughs> whatever. But for me, it's okay, what, dumb or not, maybe that person experienced some sort of like suffering or frustration around that issue. So um, what I wondered then though was like, are these people who are seeing that, do they give a shit about the NSA? Do these people give a shit about um, Homeland Security or RFID chips or any of that kind of stuff? Do they care about these larger, broader invasions of privacy? And so sometimes I think these issues come up as sort of a symptom of anxieties people are feeling about larger issues. Like, I don't really see why they would care about the Twitter thing, but I think they're probably feeling like, oh, fuck, everybody's watching me. Like, where's my private space? Where's my private space? So it comes up that way. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. It's like, it's a symptom of a disease, right? So if someone has, you know, maybe they have cancer, they're coughing, right? So it's a symptom. The same thing is our society is not healthy right now. There's stuff that's going on. People feel like invaded. So a, a symptom of that instead of a cough would be to be over hyper anxious about the Twitter thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think there's a lot of things like that in our society. And I wanted to get on. I noticed that you had listed on, on your website that you are so were a specialist in anarchy. <laughs> oh, because I talk about that sometimes. Uh, I want to I want to know. So I want to know. I uh, would consider myself politically ambiguous slash independent because uh-huh. I feel like my political beliefs come from a little bit here and a little bit there. And then I, I'm also at odds with myself. Because what my core political beliefs are, I honestly, to God, with my hand raised, do not think that it will ever happen, considering the current climate and the current way the country is. And I just don't think that... Can you tell me what that is in a... Like, yes. And like, and like try, try it in like two sentences, because sometimes uh, you can do it however you want. I'm asking for two sentences only because sometimes I feel like... I lose my own vision when I expand too much. It's going to be more than two sentences. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So I'll explain what yeah. I, what my core belief is and then why I feel like it can't yeah, yeah, exist. Please. So my core belief is I'm a pretty diehard socialist. I feel that, um, that the government should pl- supply free education and free health care and create a society where people are equal. But I don't feel like that could happen. And I don't believe, and I don't, even want socialism to happen especially in america because i feel that um, i don't trust the current government or Mm -hmm. any government within the last in america in the past 40 years i would say yeah um like post fdr yeah 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 yeah. i well yeah i'm watching untold history of the u.s right now Uh (laughs) (laughs) um but so i don't so i don't trust the government so to have a social society in America, I wouldn't trust giving 60% of my tax dollars to the U.S. government because I don't trust that they would use it for the betterment of society. So my ideological belief clashes with what is reality because I don't think that those two could coexist. And so then I feel like I want to give less money and resources to the government and I feel almost borderline libertarian sometimes. So I go very back and forth because... I just don't think that what I want could ever happen in this country. Yeah. Um, That was pretty concise, by the way. So I totally got it. It wasn't two sentences. That was like five sentences. (laughs) Um, No, no, it was, it was great. I I think I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, I wouldn't refer to myself as a socialist or aim for socialism for various reasons, but I mean, I think when I talk about anarchy, First of all, there's a way in which we are all anarchists already, which means that we are kind of all doing exactly what we want. Now, Our this own is, things. <laughs> yes. This is like a Zen. It's almost like a Zen koan. It's like, is everybody doing what they want or are we not doing what we want? It's a sort of confusing. How do you define what we want? But um, that aside, uh, what I really mean is I don't. I, I again want to occupy that sort of impossible position, which is um, I don't think we need governments. I don't think we need states. I don't think we need stop signs. I don't think we need police. I don't think we need any of that. Now, if I asked everybody to do that tomorrow, could they do it? I have no idea. 
<laughs> but what <laughs> there would be car crashes everywhere People yeah right <laughs> although there is evidence which is interesting there was this town i think it was in ohio that removed all the stop signs as an experiment and there were less accidents after they removed the stop signs which really? is kind of cool yeah um so I think there, there because are some, people were, maybe people were more cautious. They were more because they're like, oh, there's no stop sign here. I need exactly. to watch out. Exactly, <laughs> they had to be dependent on signals from each other instead of like an externally placed signal. But anyway, I I, I just sort of think that uh, I want to be working on imagining how that would work, and I can't do that from any other sort of position. So when people say to me, um. So there's this religious thinker, G.K. Chesterton, who had all sorts of problems, but something he said was like, uh, the practical is always a lie. The dream is always eternal. And what that means is that the practical is always shifting. Like what we allow and what we say is possible and probable and all that, that's always shifting around. That's always changing. But the thing that I can really focus on and work on all the time is the dream that I have for the world. So that to me is the more real thing. And anarchism where people are individually choosing to do what they want to do based on knowing themselves, knowing the world, having compassion for each other, um, and wanting freedom for everybody is that's the best proposition I can think of. (laughs) So I'm going to work on that. You know, everybody else can work on all the other stuff. I don't, I'm not asking anybody to join me because if I did, it wouldn't actually be anarchism. (laughs) (laughs) So it's sort of, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of just a re uh, a re-envisioning of what a dream is. Is a dream something that's just sort of a wistful throwaway thing or do I take it seriously? If I take it seriously, then um, anarchism is a real thing. Um, it's in me. It's in my heart. So I'm going to pursue it um, as much as I can in my thinking and, and, and for others. And honestly, it's made me nicer to other people. Do you I- consider anarchy just... Um- the idea that you are kind of autonomous or are you taking it as anti-establishment? It's both. So when I'm at my most autonomous, I notice how different I am than a lot of establishment things. Um, when I sort of externalize it in that class, I'm, I'm not a classical throw the bomb at the factory anarchist, you know, I don't, <laughs> I'm not like, that's what anarchism like means to a lot of people. that's associated with class, the word classic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, right. A true classic. The little black bomb with a little fuse coming off the top. This is Acme on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's a wily coyote. Um, but I'm not, I, I'm not in that sense. But I think, um, uh, oh, what was I going to say? I think that um, I do see that everything that people level against anarchism, which is, well, people will be killing each other. There would be I, I don't think that's wars. true. I there would be blah, blah, blah. First but that's, of all. <laughs> that's true of what's happening now. First everything, of all. Yeah. So people who actually say there would be people killing each other. Yeah. I think that we would self-regulate. Totally. And then people saying that um, would, there would be wars. Kind of what you said. What do you say? That's going, on, that's going on now. But also, um, pe- I think people in general are so unorganized <laughs> that they could not totally. raise their own armies in general. <laughs> I mean, have you ever tried, have you ever, if you've ever spoken at a union meeting or a group meeting and tried to get everyone organized, it's like herding cats. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think we would be able to organize it, armies without this false idea of governments or whatever or and you know it's funny to me too is like there's all these my friend Doug Rushkoff also says this but um luckily I will claim to have thought it before he did even though he, <laughs> he has it in a book that he wrote it about um <laughs> he it, even though he's the world's expert on I, this. <laughs> yes. but I, I've noticed all these like zombie movies coming out right yeah Where, like People, it, it's like, and, and people view that as like, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. And when I watch them, I'm like, God, this is like everyone's fantasy right now. Like they want to hang out in the barn. They want to like, they don't go have out. to go to work. They don't have to go to work. <laughs> they get to hang out with their friends and drink. Like all the shit at the store is free. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's this issue of like flesh eating beans, like all around, <laughs> but people are really just like fantasizing about living in some sort of anarchistic lifestyle because they're tired of all the shit. It's like, yeah, well you have zombies, but just like you said, every other bullshit thing, paying the bills and all that kind of stuff, that's all gone. I talk about that all the time with my husband. We talk about, can the aliens just get here and take over so all this sh- <laughs> this world can just collapse? And we don't, yeah. we don't, 
want the world to collapse in fires and and bombs and everyone's killing each other but i feel like have you seen magnolia where the frogs fall at the end yeah 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 i feel like something needs to happen on that level to just wake people up and realize that the lives that they're leading are not authentic in general i'm i'm t- when i say this i'm talking about the conventional mainstream obviously right. not out of the box artists and thinkers and movers and shakers but i mean It's like people who go every day to a job that they hate to get money, to pay for things that they don't even want, to fit into what society is saying is quote unquote normal. It's like if something happened, like an alien came down or the zombies came down or frogs, you know, rain from Mm -hmm. the earth. I feel like it would just be such a jolt to society that people would wake up and say, hey, what am I doing here? I think what we actually have in place is even better than that. This is me being my most optimistic because (laughs) I have some, in my darker times, I agree with you. But my most optimistic is that that actually happens to almost everybody at some point in their lives, right? Like my friend's father just died and he is just, if, if he is in it. You know what I mean? Like when, when my mom died, I was in it. And then I had, you know, I had a boyfriend that beat me up and I was in it, right? I had this jolt that was like, are you going to change? Are you going to change? Or are you going to keep doing the same shit that you're doing, right? So everybody gets that so, and everybody gets it in a different way. Some people get it because what I, I mean, some people get it by winning the lottery for fuck's sake. You know, some people get it in a positive way and some people get it in a totally negative way. So I think what we have is actually this great opportunity to link up with other people that have had that experience and be like, yo, I had my life fall apart. You had your life fall apart. Let's not go back to the way that we're doing things. Let's do something new and let's do it together. So it happens individually. The alien shows up for everybody. That's why like astrologically it's called Saturn return. It's like (laughs) that completely bizarre planet shows up again and suddenly your life falls apart. And it's like, do you want to keep doing shit the same way? And everybody goes through that. Totally agree with you. The reason I'm wanting some massive event (laughs) so that we can all have it happen at the same time and be aligned you know i know people that haven't woken up from it and that's why i want the the alien or the punch them in the face (laughs) (laughs) you know i have i have set their houses on fire (laughs) (laughs) let's do the anarchy thing and help them wake up i know people that have had cancer that have almost died and and are still you know uh, are have had near death experiences literally and then change for about a week and go, I'm going to change. I'm going to fix my life and then just go back to the way that they were. Right. And so I totally agree with you. I've had that personal experience where I've had things happen to me. I had an abusive boyfriend. Yeah. Um, before the, the guy I'm with now that I'm married to that woke me up. I was like, I, because I had a string of bad boyfriends, but it wasn't that bad. And when it got that bad where, you know, he tried to kill me, um, I was like, whoa. I've been with this man for two and a half years. At what point did I keep saying, because I don't know what your situation was, but it escalated, it escalated, Mm -hmm. it escalated. At what point did I just keep allowing it? It was a wake up call for me. I was like, I should have left like a year and a half ago. You know what I mean? And so that was a wake up call. I've had other wake up calls as well. Um, And, you know, I'm not even, I don't have this crazy story. Like a lot of people are, you know, heroin addicts and other things. And they have a wake up call where they're on the ground in their own puke and other, I haven't had that extreme, but I've had my own, you know, wake right. up calls. And so I think everyone does have that. And I think they're so important to learn from and not just say, well, why is this happening to me? Why, 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 why? And in a victim way and say, wait, why is this happening to me? Why, why, why? In a right. let's expand our minds, grow and learn. But I just get so frustrated sometimes where where I go back and forth too politically and socially where I go and I come from extreme compassion and love and I feel like this world is going to be okay and everyone's going to be okay and then sometimes I'll see something or hear something and I'm like you know what we're just all going to hell in a handbasket <laughs> I, no no I, so can I, I want to respond to a few things that you said because it's all very it, it's so it's intense first of all and it's I mean it, it's awesome that you're so open that you can talk about it because some people can't even talk about those experiences First of all, if someone is about to die of cancer and has like a near death experience and doesn't change their lives, then the aliens aren't going to change that person. Either, right. <laughs> so that's, that's the first thing. And the, you the, don't think the aliens would change them? No, not if, not if, I mean, not if they're almost going to die. Right. Like, I mean, I do think it would have an effect, but it'd just be like the internet, right? Like the internet is something that is in a lot of ways fundamentally new. And yet 
a lot of people just use it to fuck off and do nothing new with their lives, right? But here's the, that's an alien. The internet's a fucking alien. Like <laughs> broadcast Lady Gaga's an alien. You know what I mean? Like she's broadcasting bizarro messages about fashion and shit to people. You know, everything is an alien. Everything Even Twitter. Well, even Twitter. People Twitter's are using an alien. people are using Twitter to have social and absolutely revolutions. You know, look at Egypt. Look right. at they are using Twitter in a way that is creating massive change in society. And some people are tweeting about Justin Bieber. <laughs> right. So, so what, so the reason why the alien thing doesn't work, the reason why we don't get another Jesus Christ moment or whatever, however you want to talk about it is because what matters is not the thing that happens, but how we greet it. And the reason why it matters, how we greet it is because we have free will. And so if we didn't have free will, then the alien thing would work. But unfortunately <laughs> we do have free will and I'm, glad and i'm glad we do but we have to we have to meet it and that that's up to us and so the the good news about that is that we get to choose to change our lives which is so much cooler than just having it irrevocably change on its own you know because that's that's what death is death is the thing that you don't choose death is just thing that happens but are you telling me that these two people in my life that had near-death experiences that haven't changed they're hopeless no, it just wasn't the th- it just wasn't the alien they needed to see. You because know what I mean? I am I am in prayer and hope and compassion for these these two, and I'm not going to say who it is because they're very close to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but luckily I've had a lot of people that have near death experiences, so they they're not sure if they're listening. <laughs> Sometimes it's a long change too. You know what I mean? Sometimes something happens and you don't change because of it until like ten years later when you're like whoa, that was fucked up. You know, I mean, like people who, uh, it's it's like l- looking back on your relationship, like you said, it was a slow burn. It was, oh, two, it was a slow burn. It, it was, was two years till you realized that, right? Two and a half too long. Right. <laughs> so some people are not going to realize that they're having, that they had a near-death experience until two and a half years later. And then they're going to be like, whoa, I almost died. You Do know? you think it's like a denial system or something that's hmm. kind of, maybe their ego's trying to be safe? Oh, that's a good question. I don't I don't like the idea of denial. I like the idea of innocence. I think that people are just um they're, they're just, not ready. They're just innocent until they know. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I'm being so much nicer than I usually am about all this. I'm <laughs> total like no bullshit. Fuck you. Get your shit together a lot of times too. But but uh, They need to wake up. They almost died. <laughs> yeah, right. When I'm on podcasts, I'm like the hugging saint. And then like in real life, I'm like, hurry up and get in your fucking lane, you asshole. <laughs> so I don't I don't mean to sound so like nice about it. No, it's it just it's just for me frustrating. I'm I still struggle with acceptance and uh, healthy detachment because as someone who really loves these people, I want to be like, OK, you almost had a heart attack and you almost etc cetera, etc cetera, and you have diabetes and you're still eating a box of cookies you know it just it's not the killing themselves quote unquote like as if it, they were doing heroin but it's the killing themselves they're killing themselves if someone has extreme diabetes and is has a lot of health problems and they're 200 pounds overweight they need to not eat a box of cookies every day. You know what I mean? You're right. Except the, the only thing except they have free will and they love cookies. It, yes, that, that was the thing I would say with and the counter. And it's is like wearing a camouflage. Well, I don't think that I don't think they're eating cookies because they have free will. But I will say maybe they enjoy the experience of eating cookies. Maybe the experience of eating cookies is more important to them than their own lives. I mean, actually, in fact, that it has is. to be true. Yeah. Right. And and that's how it is for me. Like when I want. I'm not comparing this to death, but <laughs> one, one in six pack abs is a type of death. So I've had a six pack. I've had a six pack before in my life and I wanted, and, and, and I want it back now. Right. But today I ate, th- this is how crazy my body is. If I eat any carbs at all, I'm hopeless. I ate brown rice today and I've been feeling like shit about it all day, but I was like, I really wanted that brown rice. So the, the fact of the matter is for me, like, having that was more important to me today. And you know what? My life is not measured by, and the value of my life is not measured by how healthy I am or how long I have until I die. It's measured by something else. And I think that that's how much fun you're having and you love eating your carbs. That's part of it. Yeah. (laughs) That's part of it. 
I mean, I think it's hard for you on the outside or you in general, not just you in particular, but you too. It's like, it's hard from the outside to see someone, you know, doing something that's destructive because that's painful to us. But to them, that may not be pain. That may be pleasure. And so then we're saying, get rid of the thing that makes you feel good so I can feel better about how you're doing. Now, I'm not saying that that's exactly what you're doing. I'm just saying that's a component of it too that we need to think about. That's true. It is definitely true, but I just have a lot of concern for this person and then another person that I just gave up on. <laughs> Ultim- and ultimately, I agree with you. Ultimately, that person needs to just stop eating the cookies and take care of themselves because they can have so many more varied experiences and they get to have new problems. They get to have new challenges and all that once they get rid of this old challenge. And I, and I like that idea. I like the idea of getting rid of the old challenge so we can have a new one um, because I think it broadens our soul. But... Um, but you know, maybe that person, maybe it's just not going to happen. This go, <laughs> this go around. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. How did you start as a writer? Because you have written f- for quite a few reputable publications and also you're writing your book right now. What, what was, was it something that you always had a passion for or you're like, I just have all these ideas in my head. I need to get them out. <laughs> yeah. I've always had, it's, it, this is the first time I'm realizing this actually. The year I started writing was also the year I saw my first porn. So I was seven. See how holistic everything is? It is. I was seven years old. I was seven years old and I started writing a novel, which is must be where I put all my sexual energy after I saw that porn. Um, my parents had just gotten divorced. My mom got a computer and I started writing this fantasy novel because I used to, when I was a little kid, read these like 500 page books. So I've just been reading like, they were like fantasy and science fiction novels when I was very, whoa, okay. When I was very Mitzi little. does not I, like sci-fi. Sorry. She doesn't like fantasy. <laughs> she only likes dog Rom-com books. Rom-com only. Yeah. She likes dog books about books. bones. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that would be horror. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I, I mean, I started reading, like, uh, adult books at a very young age and <laughs> watching adult films at a very young age. And so I just, I it, w- it was when I was seven years old, so I've always wanted to write. Always. I don't know. I even, I found my mom's diary. My mom died when I was 24, so, we, I, so I'm not just invading her stuff. Um, I found her when diary. You were, when you were 24 or when she was 24? When I was 24, yeah. Oh, okay, I was like, oh my yeah. gosh, that's so yeah. young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How old were you? <laughs> yeah, right. I was <laughs> zero. So, yeah, no, I di- she died when I was 24. So I, I was reading one of her diaries, and it said, you know, I've never seen, it was right after I was born, and it said, I've never seen a baby who likes books so much. So as soon as I could even grasp things, I was pulling books towards me and, like, paging through them. I could read before I was in kindergarten and uh so i just always wanted to be a writer and the other thing i always wanted to do is be a porn actor so where did you did you get frustrated being i know something that happens to a lot of gifted kids is that they get frustrated because the system is set up for a very specific level of education Mm -hmm. and learning and so sometimes it can be mind-boggling i know for me i was a very advanced reader when children were just learning how to read and i would get so bored and so frustrated and so antsy and anxious because i just felt like i wanted more 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 yep and and you can be isolated i remember uh nicole gerhardt saying to me in first grade you didn't do your reading homework and i was like i don't have to i already know how to read like <laughs> and I felt, I felt like i was being accused of doing the wrong thing for being advanced so like yeah i felt you're you're totally right like you, you get frustrated you feel isolated um and yeah i almost failed out of high school i mean i was a terrible student in high school because i was so angry and i remember having a moment too when i i don't know if i was in middle school or high school where kids were like raising their hands and i was like wait a second why do i have to raise my hand to ask a question or go to the bathroom and it it like turned over in my head. I was like, holy shit, this is a cult. (laughs) And and once you figure that out, your teachers don't like you. It is is a cult. I, I thought about stuff like that all the time. We had a very strict dress code in my high school. And to me, it didn't make logical sense. I was like, why Mm. can't, can't we wear whatever we want? Because we, I went to a a gifted college prep school and I was like, they're supposed to be preparing us for the real world. But part of, the real world is you can right. wear whatever you want. And so, it, cause people would get in trouble. Like kids would get in trouble and they would be like suspended for wearing, um, flip flops. Yeah. <laughs> flip flops. You were, you were punished for that because they, 
because they said that your shoes could fall off or you you I don't know I don't remember the reason but it was something like you couldn't have backless shoes so you couldn't wear clogs and you couldn't wear flip flops and kids would get punished and get detentions so always some bullshit arbitrary reason it doesn't make any sense and I remember being like this doesn't make any sense and also like if you had shorts that or a skirt that went above your fingertips or something like that and huh. most women's shorts don't go longer than your fingertips. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Yeah, right. So you couldn't wear shorts. And I grew up in New Orleans where the, I mean. It was muggy. Yeah, it gets hot. I mean, the, the springtime is like 95 with Caribbean humidity. And so yeah. you w- wanted to wear shorts because you would be sweating like crazy. And they're like, no, you're going to get suspended. And and it didn't have anything. To, Just arbitrary torture. To do with education. Yes. That's what was so infuriating is Obedience. that. Obedience. It That's didn't have anything to do with education. It was just follow the rules to to have rules and that is something that really bugs me because it's not you're wasting the kids imaginations they could be doing so much more with their imagination than than checking if they have you know the right shoes and the right shorts on and there was such a strong emphasis on it it was like so pushed hard and i was like why it's 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 insane and and so that feeling that you're describing as a child right now and that and that i've also had in my life and that i'm sure a lot of people who are listening to this have that's how i felt that's why i'm writing the book i'm writing because that's how i felt about sex my whole life it's like what this is arbitrary it's arbitrary torture it's obedience training it has nothing to do with how we should live our lives and and I remember also there's always like a dumb seedy fucked up reason. I remember we couldn't wear hats in my high school. And when asked why, the principal said, well, we don't want the black kids, which were like three of, wearing <laughs> Malcolm X hats because Malcolm X was a racist, which is a fucking insane. You know what? There is a lot of misinformation about that and it really bugs me. And there's even misinformation in the black community. I have a black friend who, it, that who is kind of racist and he is a big Malcolm X fan he believed that Malcolm X was anti-white I was just listening to Pacifica Radio and I was listening to an amazing speech from Malcolm X's own mouth Mm -hmm. he was not anti-white at all yeah at all he's very pro-peace he just wasn't he wasn't as pro peace as Martin Luther King. His message was just different, but, but message, he was about peace. His I message was about peace and yeah. unity and that we're all like one. Yeah. And his message was so like, I was listening to it and I was in tears because it was so pro love. Right. It was amazing. And other black Panther, I, I, I was listening to, I can't remember the black Panthers leader's name, but I was listening to this black Panther speech on Pacifica radio. And it was like, just so it wasn't about anti-white. It was about anti-imperialism. It was about anti-control of less fortunate people. And you hear these stereotypes like the Black Panther movement was this extreme black movement or Malcolm X was against white people and and violent and for pro-violence. And they're not. It's not true. It's it's not true at all. And even even in high school, I think I had a sense of that. But I didn't know the specifics because the the line that was being given to me by authority figures was that Malcolm X was uh, racist. Now, first of and all, and also that he was an extremist, and it, also yeah, I, totally. And and you know, it's interesting to me to sit across from you and have you say, "Why well, have this black friend who's kind of racist?" Because actually, in in an ethnic racial way you've been given permission to say that in a way that a white person shouldn't say right so like i don't think i i just don't think black people can be racist against white people (laughs) like i don't i don't even get it like it's the wrong word for it to me because white is white is like a stand-in word for imperialism it's a stand-in word for all those things that you're talking about so like i don't know it's it's the whole thing is so complex. The he's, idea of he's, boiling, an, he's anti-white. He, he he's anti-white. He's anti-white. So that's 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 a fascinating proposition. So then, what happens to someone like me, who I'm half Syrian and then half white? So um, you know, some people like to consider Middle Eastern people white. I certainly do not. Uh, because we're no, <laughs> I'm like um, yeah, no. exactly. <laughs> But then, then what happens to me? I remember there was so much racial tension in my high school when I when I was a kid. I actually wrote this essay, but I wrote this series of essays called "Guys I Wanted to Fuck in High School," um, and it's it's on my blog. We I, probably had the same list. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they were from my high school though. They weren't like, but they weren't celebrity. But yeah, I I 
And the second one is sort of about all the racial tension in my school because where I grew up, it was all like... Where did you grow up? In in, uh, small town Pennsylvania. Okay. So there were KKK marches. um, There were tons of skinheads. So the idea that the principal would say well, the most racist threat we need to deal with is Malcolm X here when we have like four black kids in this small town school was patently absurd. I mean, it was just, t- that was the most racist thing you could say. Like, while well, one th- intelligent black man is the most racist thing we can think of. It was like, no, you have skinheads in this school. You have white power rallies in the town. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Who has the power here? So that to me was such a weird, bizarre, tense time. And I... I experienced so much racism as a kid. I mean, my dad is, uh, he looks black almost. I mean, he's, he doesn't look black, but he has skin that's as dark as a lot of black people's skin. So it was just very, uh, it was very bizarre. All these, like all these intersections. Um, anyway, that all came from just talking about the school uniform policy. and how we <laughs> See how the podcast is free flowing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> no, there's just so many issues to talk about and so many important things. And I think that people need to be made aware of. And I think the number one thing that it goes back to, whether it's sex or race or class or imperialism or whatever it is, is why back to your original question. When you said we need to ask why, 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 why? And Because it's so important for us to question our beliefs and not in a way that we're throwing them all out, but just look at each one kind of like an M&M or a marble and say, hmm, do I really believe this or is this something that's been passed down to me and I was brainwashed or conditioned or is this something that I really, truly believe? And if it is something that I believe, where does that come from? Right. And and not to and to always remember that love is a higher value than any other than any reason so it's like whenever you come up to a reason that's like well i don't agree with this person that's fine but love is a higher principle than whatever reasoning you've come up with so even if you don't agree with the person it's not an excuse to uh hate them or abuse them or whatever or commit violence against them now it's not saying I, i'm not saying we don't stop violence when we see it or we don't try to prevent it but um but we can't but but we can't lose our sense of compassion for other people as we try to do that. Do you think that this goes back to what you were saying before, but I want to talk about your this point in your book and I totally forgot and got off track. Um, do you think that the sexual repression that we have in our society creates sexual dysfunction? Creates sexual dysfunction or like social dysfunction? Uh, you- both. Like for, so if we lived in a more open, free and sexually accepting society, would there be as extreme, um, how do I word it? So in Japan, they're very, very sexually, it's a sexually repressed culture, Mm -hmm. right? It's extremely sexually repressed. Japanese pornography tends to be the most extreme Mm -hmm. in pornography. So repression, in my experience, tends to lead to extreme extremity, whereas societies like... uh, you know, the Netherlands or where they're very sexually open and um, with, you know, sexuality as well as drugs and other things like that, they have a very low rate of Mm -hmm. drug addiction, of sexual exploitation. Yeah, I think the there's a study um i'm actually gonna write about this pretty soon there's a study that sort of correlated all the studies on pornography um to see if it was related to sexual violence because that's something that people claim all the time and in fact what they found was in atmospheres that were more permissive of pornography there was so much less sexual violence right so like so the the more porn, the more accessible and available pornography is for people, the less violent, uh, the less sexually abusive those cultures are. So the quite the contrary to what people think all the time. I mean, at the very worst, it rendered pornography neutral. It didn't uh, it didn't help people be more open or make them worse. Um, but it never has been shown to make things worse. So I think sure there's that's just pornography but i think sure there is like definitely a correlation between sexual openness and uh and you know sexual abuse i mean i do think there's a a spectrum there um socially i think sexuality is all about again this is part of my anarchist ideal but um sexuality is all about the individual i can't think of something that's more individualized than sexuality and we can see this down to just our everyday uh 
patterns or tastes like when you're out with your friend and you're like oh i think that guy is hot and your friend is like ugh, that guy <laughs> it's totally unbridgeable right like you just can't see what the other person is seeing or like if you like being <laughs> that's happened a couple times yeah right <laughs> right or like you like being peed on or you like someone being verbal or you like you know being held down and having aggressive sex or you like whatever it's very difficult for people to understand each other sexually and that there are a whole lot of reasons for that so without going into those i just think sex is very highly individualized so when we have social dysfunction that's related to sexual uh repression it's just because we don't let individuals in, as a whole express, express themselves, themselves as yeah. individuals yeah well, Connor, we're running out of time, but I want to keep you here. I've actually had Mitzi lock the door. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we're staying for episode two and three. No, um, thank you so much for doing the podcast. Uh, do you have anything to promote other than the book coming out? What's no, your Twitter? Um, just website? my Twitter is at Connor Habib, and that's C-O-N-N-E-R. Um, H-A-B-I-B people spell it O-R but it's C-O-N-N-E-R H-A-B-I-B <laughs> um, at Connor Beeb I have I don't know when you're putting this up I have an article I mean it'll be out either way I have an article coming out on The Stranger tomorrow and they're sort of giving it a really big push um, that's called What I Want to Know is Why You Hate Porn Stars and that uh, article is sort of a culmination of my thinking about ideas of why culture has our culture has issues with porn interspersed with a story about a boyfriend I had who was really always struggling with the fact that I had done pornography. So, um, uh, so that'll be out. So you can find that, um, on the stranger. And, uh, I think that's all I really want to promote. When is this going to come out? Do you know? Um, I will let you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, Out of the Box Podcast is sponsored by HugMeTees.com. Spread love, give a hug, HugMeTees.com. Guys, if you enjoy the podcast, please go to iTunes and Stitcher and leave a comment. It really helps us out a lot. You can also visit OutoftheBoxPodcast.com to see more information about Connor. And also, you can click on the donate button. We're now accepting Litecoins and Bitcoins, OutoftheBoxPodcast.com. Thank you so much, guys, and stay listening. Mm-hmm.